Wow. I just am always amazed and give thanks for musicians such as that who can do two feet, two hands, four keyboards and keep it going. Thanks be to God for sharing their talent. We'll be following Holy Eucharist Rite 2, which if you do have a prayer book and would like to follow in the prayer book, it begins on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily serve, worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, immortal one have, have mercy, mercy on us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. For as you <laughs> always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make the boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is a reading from the book of Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning, he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 116, verses 1 through 8. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I have called upon him. The cords of death entangle me, the grip of the grave took hold of me, and I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought very low and he helped me. Turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has treated you well. For you have rescued my life from death, my ears from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. Our second reading this morning is from James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. 
Or look at ships, though they are so large it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, set on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue. A restless evil full of deadly poison, with it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Bear with me. Take up my cross, the Savior said, if you would my disciples be. Take up your cross with willing heart and humbly follow after me. Take up your cross, let not its weight fill your weak spirit with alarm. His strength shall bear your spirit up and brace your heart and nerve your arm. Take up your cross. The shame and let your foolish heart be still. The Lord for you accepted death upon a cross on Calvary's hill. Take up your cross and in his strength and calmly every danger brave it guides you to an abundant life and leads to victory or the grave take up your cross and follow Christ nor think that death to lay it down for only those who bear the cross may hope to wear the glorious crown. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark in the eighth chapter. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And his disciples answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. So Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell any. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. 
for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. What a week. What a week. For me, I had a lot of challenges this week, and I think my biggest challenge this week was preparing for the sermon, and I, I wasn't sure what to focus on. For sermon prep, after praying and meditating and living with the scriptures for a week, I usually come up with a focus statement, or you might call it a theme, or um, I don't know, even a topic. For inspiration, I try to let God help me focus on what God might want us to hear. So when I go out during the week, I watch for God's inspirations. Uh, that's my little word combining God and inspiration, God's inspirations. And then after studying scripture for days and before I start jotting down my thoughts and notes, and even before I'm brave enough to start typing and composing a sermon, I say a short prayer. And I said it just a second ago within me, even as I preach, I say, Less of me, God, less of me, and more of you. Now, that short prayer usually opens up my words, and God's Spirit helps me start typing, and the sermon material often just flows. Less of me, God, and more of you. I said it so often this week because I just didn't even know how to get started, and, and I wondered if I was getting in the way of what God wanted us to hear or say. I was frustrated. I studied and studied, and I started writing three different sermons with three different themes. And yeah, you're probably offering a silent prayer right now of Thanksgiving that you're not going to hear three themes and three sermons today. It's just too much. But for me, this week was so disappointing in so many ways, and, and maybe that's where I got stuck on my sermon development. For me, the week was personally disappointing worldly disappointing and spiritually disappointing. And I guess it's a perfect trifecta in my week for disappointment. My worldly disappointment moments might be some you probably had experience with too. On this, the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on our soil at the Pentagon and the World Trade Centers in Pennsylvania, I vividly recall those attacks with deep sadness and remember the fear that started swelling up within me. Everything as we knew it all of a sudden seemed to change. Our homeland was made vulnerable and the smoldering waste and remains at each site weakened and damaged the image that I had made, or maybe that you even had made of what America stood for, literally. What America stood for was no longer standing. The attacks tore us all open in more ways than I could have imagined on more levels of society, politics, world status, and more. The attacks brought us down to our knees in shock and pain. They took away our breath as a nation. And in my way of thinking this week, the attacks of September 11th, 2001, were just the beginning of what is continuing to happen today. Since then, without even realizing it, I became quicker to judge, faster to suspect, and maybe even to loaf or despise. I became quick to hide my vulnerability, trying to hide myself and protect myself because the world wasn't safe anymore. In the world, I was quick to give my opinions. I was less quick to give my opinions as answers. I kept things to myself. Fear rose faster with me. And all these reactions, we all touched on somehow. As I see it, 
the attacks began a reign of suspicion, anger, maybe even fear within all of the United States. And this supremacy of negativity continues to grow stronger and stronger each day since 9-11, right up to and including this very moment. That was my worldly disappointment. Confounding that disappointment and fear and all those emotions comes my personal disappointment. I am disappointed in me. My reactions to the world have changed so much that I question more. I try to control and get my own ways more. I rely less on God and more on myself for how life will be run. I have an opinion, or I have lots of opinion, but I have an opinion on how my life should go. And that comes along with opinions on how you and others should act and what you should do or what they should do and say and think for me. The terrorist attacks may have or may not have started these changes in me, but then you throw in the pandemic from COVID-19 and that certainly has multiplied my personal and maybe even my society changes in what I see happening with relationships and humanity everywhere. I'm personally disappointed because I get so easily sad when I see how we argue about our personal decisions to vaccinate or not vaccinate. I get agitated when I see how we try to force these decisions and other decisions on the institutions that I hold dear, be they schools, government, churches, organizations. We used to jokingly say my way or the highway, and now we live it as a reality. Whatever our choice, it seems to me that we are only owning our own subjective opinions and they most often lead to disappointment and disagreeing, canceling out God, canceling out relationships with others, canceling out culture. These days, when I go to look for God's inspirations in the world, I frequently see something different. I frequently see selfishness, anger instead of God's inspirations. Maybe I even sense or see fear and self-righteousness. And these traits have come out of hiding in our society now. And now they seem to be the main stage in the spotlight of life. At least that's the way I see it sometimes. I am disappointed. I am disappointed when these behaviors show up in me. It felt this week and it feels like we are busy when we are busy trying to gain the world. We lose ourselves. My spiritual disappointment is with God. That's right. I am disappointed with God. Now, I will try to be careful and sensitive here because many of us have been taught that it is simply unfaithful to name disappointment with God as there is no surer mark of the lack of faith. Other people maybe don't think it's unfaithful to be disappointed in God, but it might make some uncomfortable. Faith, as we've picked it along somewhere along the way of our lives, is the opposite of doubt, which makes talking about our disappointment with God so difficult and so important. We only have to look at the Psalms to see life full of complaints and grievances and disappointments and doubts. And as you read the Psalms, some of them of lament, you come to realize like those of old, that naming our disappointments and doubts is nothing new. Naming our disappointments and doubts seems essential to the life of faith, and indeed, part of the necessary process of being renewed in faith. In addition to reading the Psalms, I sometimes read other theological articles, I study scriptural scholars, and I come across sometimes an article that so powerfully says what my soul and heart is feeling and thinking that I find it difficult to not use the author's words in my own sermons. And that happened this week. I read an article by pastor and theologian David Lose. I'm going to intersperse my words with some of his and, and I'll let you know some of his quotes because he says exactly what I needed to say or hear this week. 
He puts my thoughts into the words I want to share today, especially when he says, and this is the quote, I think there could be no better passage with which to explore the disappointing facets of our faith life than the confession and rebuke of Peter. And both the confession and the rebuke matter. Because if there is one emotion we can imagine Peter feeling after he is rebuked by his Lord, the Lord he so desperately wants to protect from harm, it's disappointment. Anger, perhaps, also. Maybe Peter's feeling embarrassment, maybe that's likely. But at the head of all these feelings is disappointment. Disappointment precisely because Peter has just named perhaps just realized in the flesh of inspired insight that this man Jesus to whom he has pledged himself is indeed God's promised Messiah, the living and breathing hope of Israel. And maybe which, of course, that is why Peter reacts so strongly to Jesus's prediction of his fate. Peter cannot simply imagine that the Messiah will suffer, let alone be killed, so great is his shock, perhaps, that he can't even hear the part where Jesus says about rising on the third day. All Peter probably hears is the word, the awful, unthinkable word, that his hope of Israel will be killed. And so he protests and he gets rebuked. Lois goes on to suggest that a lot of people might feel this way when they voice their own disappointments with God, as if it is wrong to doubt God. Maybe they think they are wrong to do so. And some people maybe have told that this to their face, told verbally that it is wrong to do so. And yet uh, author Lowe's wants to suggest that there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with Peter. Peter may be mistaken about how events will play out and he surely has more to learn about the God he worships and the Messiah he follows but he is not wrong in assuming that God's son should suffer no harm. Everything Peter has been taught and everything Peter knows about God screams that this can't be true. God's beloved should suffer no harm. You know, and to be perfectly honest, do we really think we've been, we would react or be any different? I mean, who would imagine that the God of heaven and earth would redeem Israel and the world by dying a criminal's death? Who could predict that God's strength would be revealed most fully in weakness? Or that God's judgment would be rendered so completely in undeserved and unexpected mercy? It is plain and simple, unthinkable to think that could happen. And so also with us, I think, we are not wrong to wonder where God is when we learn that a beautiful child of ours receives a diagnosis or that our beloved partner is sick unto death or our prized relationship has crumbled or our, our dream jar, job um, that so much of identity is wrapped around has been limited or when any number of other disappointments and disasters fall upon us. Because everything in us teaches that these things are not what God wants or desires or wills. No, we are not wrong to be disappointed with God. But like Peter, maybe we too have more to learn. Because the God revealed in Jesus, and this is no more true any place in the scripture than in the Mark's account what we heard today, nowhere does this come forward even more clear that the God revealed in Jesus shows up dramatically and always only in the broken places of our lives and world. Like Peter, maybe we are disappointed because we do not get the God we want. We do not get the God I want, that the God we have been taught to worship is the God we have a right to respect, but it doesn't always feel that way. Peter making God into his own idea what God would be like is no different than the way we do the same. Jesus is not a one-size-fits-all type of guy. Jesus is not the powerful, forceful, takeover savior they expected and wanted. But fortunately, our story doesn't end there. 
God shows up, not the way we want, but the way we need, the way we need. Like Peter, in Jesus and his cross and resurrection, we might discover not the God we want, but the God we are so desperate for or so desperately need. The God who sheds glory to join us in our shame. The God who leaves heaven and earth to enter our hells on earth. We meet the God who abandons strength, at least strength as maybe I or you define it and imagine it, so that God can join us, embrace us, hold on to us and love and redeem us at our places of weakness. The God whom we meet in Jesus comes for those who are broken in body, mind, and spirit to be one with us, among us, and for us. This God, our God, will understand our disappointments and even expects them, I think, Moreover, this God will meet us in our disappointments to teach us anew and again that it is at the places of our brokenness where we sense, meet, and are enveloped most fully in God's strong and abiding love. Maybe that's what Jesus meant by saying that those who want to save their life, uh, along with all the expectations for God that we have built, maybe when we lose it, we will find life. And those who are able to share those expectations in the lives they've built will find life and life abandoned as it is true. God can take our disappointments, but know this, we believe in a God that also has promised to meet us in those disappointments and stay with us until we come out on the other side of disappointment to renewed and resurrected faith. I think Professor Laws got it right. I think he gets it right. For the crosses we bear are not crosses of executions. As it was with Jesus, as it was with God, as it is with God, the cross is the beginning of redemption and resurrection. The cross, the cross we are told to take up today can be the beginning of many, many resurrections for our world, for us personally, for us spiritually. So here's the challenge for the week. Go to God with your disappointments. Take up your cross with God's help. Practice resurrection. For resurrections do await for you, for me, and for all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our service continues on page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us together affirm our beliefs in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the, the Father, the, the Almighty, Almighty, maker of, of heaven, heaven and, and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. 
we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people, form three, found on page 387. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That, that your, your name, name may be glorified, glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, and lay people. That they may be faithful, faithful ministers, ministers of, of your, your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there, that there may, may be justice, justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our, our works may find, find favor in, in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they, that may, they may be, be delivered, delivered from their distress. distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let, Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints' will have entered into joy. May, May we, we also come, come to share in your heavenly kingdom. kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We have continuing prayers for Nihal, for Mike and Kathy, for Ben's continued recovery. We pray for all caregivers. We pray for the victims of gun violence and those who cause such violence the victims of any abuse or violence. We give blessings for those celebrating anniversaries and birthdays this week, especially Elaine and Seth Jackson from St. James Higginham. Continued blessings for the food deliveries that Bonnie, Dante, Helen, Catherine, and all those involved continue to do week after week. We also give prayers and thanks for our children and for our pets. And I'd like to share a prayer with you from Dr. David Mellet, president of the Christian Theological Seminary. And this is in regards to 9-11. Gracious God, we continue to grieve and lament over the tremendous loss of life that our world endured. We remember the Americans, British, Dominicans, Greeks, South Koreans, Canadians, Mexicans, Japanese, Colombians, Jamaicans, Filipinos, Ecuadorians, Australians, Germans, and those of other countries who died so tragically on 9-11 and the days that followed. We remember the families and communities who lost their loved ones. May our acknowledgement of their loss bring them some comfort and insurance and assurance that they are not alone. Help us convert our grief into renewed commitment for a diverse country where all can live safely and in peace. Help our entire world to decrease our appetite for violence, oppression, and war, and to increase our appetite for creativity, respect, and reconciliation. In your many holy and beautiful names, we pray. Amen. Amen. I ask you to take a moment to add your, your own petitions and pray for those who suffered and have died from 9-11. We thank you, Almighty God, for hearing our prayers. Amen. Into your hands, great God of heaven, we lay our prayers. 
trusting in your mercy through the one who gave us eternal life, who is also the one who calls us to share life with the world, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We greet you all in God's peace. Are there any announcements or stories to share this week as we move into the next week? I have one. Um, as some of you know, Nan and Jim Monday from the um, St. Andrew's Church, our St. Andrew's Church, um, Jim was a whip and poof, as well as John Bush and many of the um, Yale people. And um, the alumni, the Yale Alumni Magazine had a little blurb in it and Nan had sent it to me and I would like to share it with you because I think it's very spot on. Um, this person writes, I took the ferry from Orient Point to New London to attend the memorial service of Jonathan Bush in Killingworth, Connecticut. It was held in a tiny white wooden church way back in the woods, suggesting the 19th century more than the 21st. The figure of a pilgrim holding his blunder blust wouldn't have seemed a bit out of place. I couldn't help thinking how quintessentially Connecticut Yankee the Bushes were, are, and how surprising their adoption or adoption of Texas as a political base. Valerie and Peter Buckley were there, and Tucker Warner's wife, Joni, and Bud Hudson's wife, Pam. I didn't see many other classmates. Well, how many of us are left, but of course I conveyed our class condolences to Jody once again. And I just thought it was a spot on 17th century versus 21st. So. We are a small church in some ways, but a large, big world in many others. Well said, well said. Thanks, Deb. Are there any other announcements or things to share? Then let us move on to the offertory and our prayer of Holy Eucharist as we offer ourselves to you, Holy God. Except we pray our thanksgiving for all that we are and for all that we give. Bless our offering, I guess, of the fragile dreams and hopes that we have now. These invisible spiritual gifts are what sustains our faith and our life with you. Receive all that we bring to you this day, O oh God, for we offer ourselves and ask you to make it holy. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to offer God thanks and praise. Now, honor and worship are indeed your due, our Lord and our God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with people of every nation, tribe, and language, with the whole church on earth and in heaven, joyfully, with our many voices, we give you thanks and say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God, power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. All glory and honor to you, God of grace, for you gave your only son, Jesus Christ, once for all on the cross to be the one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world that all who believe him might have eternal life. The night before he died, he took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This will be my body, which is given for you. Whenever you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he also took the cup. And when he had given you thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is going to be my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, and as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. 
Therefore, Heavenly Father, in this sacrament of the suffering and death of your Son, we now celebrate the wonder of your grace and proclaim the mystery of our faith as we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Redeemer God, rich in mercy, infinite in goodness, we were far off until you brought us near, and our hands are empty until you fill them. As we share this spiritual communion through the power of your Holy Spirit, feed our souls with your heavenly food, renew us in your service, and unite us in Christ. For from you, and through you, and for you are all things to you be the glory forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In union, blessed Jesus, with all the faithful gathered here today online, those that are present together wherever they find themselves and those gathered around the world in prayer. We long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and for all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. We believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since at this time we cannot receive communion in person, we pray you to come into our hearts we unite ourselves with you and embrace you with all our hearts, our souls, and our minds. Let nothing separate us from you. Let us serve you in this life until by your grace, we come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. Let us take a moment quietly right now to be in, com in communion with our Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, Send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Go forth into the world in peace. Be strong and of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.
<clears throat> Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to Thanks God. Thanks be to God. Luke. Maria, that was one of my favorite hymns. I absolutely love that hymn. Yeah, yeah thanks. mine too. Thanks for picking it out. Of course. Oh, I'm so glad y'all enjoyed it. I love that hymn. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Thank you so much. Did, did I cut you off? Did you have a joke or anything for us today? No, I oh. didn't have one because of nine. I just haven't been in like you for the week. Haven't been in that mood, although our grandchild brings us much joy, but still have to deal with everything else in life. And it's... Yep, you set a good tone. Thank you. I just didn't want to apologize if I had cut you off. No, no thank you. Well, everybody have a great week and may blessings abound and find joy wherever you go. Go do some finding of God's inspirations. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you this morning. Bye. Good to see you. Hi there. Hi, Luke, and everybody else. Hey, Dana. <laughs> Hi, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> I'll get that one day. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Hey.